Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you to Ausveg for extending the invitation to Austrade so we could be part of the program. Um, it's been a day of really good presentations and some excellent uh, anecdotes and some really good advice. So it's terrific to see this level of uh, attention being paid uh, to the Japanese market for vegetables and for horticulture in general. Um, and it's great to see presentations by those of you in, in the business of exporting to Japan. I'm in, in the business of um, being in Japan and, and supporting Australian businesses in their efforts to expand sales and to succeed in the market. And it's something that um, I'm passionate about as well. But I'm conscious that I'm the last of a long line of speakers and I'm probably standing between you and a flight home or at least a drink. So I'll try and get to the points pretty quickly and I'll also you know, skip over some of the points that have already been made really well by the previous speakers. I'm happy to take questions at the end or comments or anything so I'll try and leave a little bit of time for that as well. So if I can work this, we'll, which way are we going? Yep. Um, a number of you I know know about Austrade and have probably worked with us in different markets. For those who haven't, then just quickly um, the obligatory explanation. So we're the federal government's agency that promotes export, investment, education and more recently tourism uh, policy and research as well. Um, it's a, we're a statutory body under the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and our CEO reports directly to the Minister. And what do we do? We help Australian businesses develop international markets, we help try and bring in useful, productive investment into Australia and um, the agricultural sector is, is high on the list there because there's a real need for good investment into the agricultural sector. We promote Australian education overseas. That can also be technical education and can also be in relation to um, uh, agricultural uh, training as well. We now strengthen Australia's tourism industry and we also... Um, uh, support, uh, well, we provide consular and passport services in the offices that are um, managed by Austrade. So if you're in Japan uh, on business and you lose your passport and you're down my way, uh, you'll get to meet me <laughs> and not just talk about carrots. <laughs> um, how we help, um, I'll just skip that one because it's, it's just a bit more detail. Um, we have a, a a global network. Um, at any one time, we have um, we have about a thousand staff altogether. At any one time, we have about six hundred and fifty staff overseas. Uh, a lot of locations. Um, we offer different services depending on the country, depending on the market. So in Japan, we support both trade and investment, even though Japan is a very mature and established market. In most of the markets that we call growth and emerging markets, so that includes Latin America, that includes African countries, um, Russia, um, some of the Southeast Asian countries, we, the main focus is on trade, so helping exporters get into the market and sell their goods and services. In what we call established markets, such as the US or the EU, that's where the focus is on uh, uh, seeking investment and also uh, promoting Australian education. So in Japan, we help with, with both sides of it. Uh, and what do we do? So we provide information and advice about the market. Um, that includes trends uh, in the different segments. We help you if you're wondering, you know, should I be exporting to Japan now or should I be exporting to Singapore, as Onishi-san said. We try and talk you through those things and, and give you advice to help you make that decision. Importantly, we're there to help identify international contacts and that means you're going to need an agent or a distributor. You're going to need buyers. We can uh, assist you with uh, business matching and putting you in contact and helping you work out who's the best key contact for you in market. Market entry and market expansion. So if you're coming to the market for the first time, that's where we can assist with a, you know, hopefully a strategic market entry and then a, a plan that looks forward and helps you um, really get well established in the market. If you're already successful in the market, that's great. Um, we can perhaps help you with uh, expanding sales outside of 
where you are. For example, you, a lot of companies come first to Tokyo. That's terrific. Um, where I am, down in Osaka and in the, the Kansai area around Osaka, the size of the economy there is roughly the same size as the South Korean economy. Okay? So it presents all sorts of opportunities that, that shouldn't go overlooked. So you might be able to get into a national distribution chain. I mean, E.ON is, is the, the leader in that and they've got coverage throughout Japan and Southeast Asia uh, like no other company. But not all distributors are like that. So you really need to know where, where your distribution network is going and whether you need um, other sales in, in other parts of the country. And identifying specific opportunities. So finding um, new opportunities for you to sell your product. That's what we do. Um, a lot of information, uh, more and more information is online on the Austrade website, so do have a look at that. We're trying to put more sort of insights about the market, more information, and make it more visible there. We have staff in Australia, in the Australian offices. We have a Trade Start network as well, and they're our sort of frontline people in Australia. They can have conversations with you. They can put you in contact with us in market as well. Financial assistance. It's here for you to utilise uh, the Export Market Development Grant Scheme. Uh, it survived the budget cuts. Um, for those that have used it, I hope it's been you know, really useful. If you haven't explored it, please do so. Uh, like a lot of government things, it's probably a bit complex and painful to make an application, but it's well worth doing. Um, you can claim you know, quite a substantial amount of eligible costs, costs that go on promotion and marketing in market. And for Japan, you're going to need that. You're going to have to spend money to promote the product. It doesn't sell itself. Okay, so this is quite important. You can see you know, almost uh, or just over $120 million worth paid into over 3,000 grants. Um, there's a two-year waiting period. There's you know, other conditions, but do investigate it if you haven't done so. All right, so that's the bit about Austrade. Um, there's been quite a few statistics already, um, so I'll try not to give you too many of those. This one I like, though, because it shows on the left-hand side there, it shows a, a list of countries. The next column is showing the total imports, the value of imported vegetables. Okay, so if we just look there, we've got China first, of course, then we've got Japan. And the total imports for China are 2.54 billion. Japan, 2.51 billion. China's got 10 times the population of Japan. Yet the value of the vegetable imports in Japan is not so different from China. Okay? So it immediately says that the value of the market in Japan is really significant, not to be overlooked. Okay? If we look at Australia's market share, we can see where it sits there. The percentage of the share is 0.9%. We can do better than that. There's room to grow. We need to grow the market share for vegetables in Japan. The overall key imports, as you all know, it's all being talked about today, and um, the key imports there. So it, it represents a lot of opportunity. Sure, there are issues, and they've been pointed to today in all the presentations. You need market access <laughs> uh, if you're going to export the fresh produce. The regulatory requirements are really strict, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, there's a declining population, but the data also showed that vegetable intake increases as the popula population ages as well. We can see a whole lot of innovation going on in Japan around vegetable intake as well. So uh, let's look at it with fresh eyes and let's think, you know, what, what opportunity does it really represent? You can see the distance between the value of the markets between Japan and the other markets underneath it, right? It's a substantial difference. Just another graph, and this one um, is showing Asian horticultural imports from all sources. And it's probably a bit hard to, to read from the back there. But I think the main point here is, uh, of course, you've got China at, at the top there, but most of those lines are on the upward trend. So that, to me, says, you know, there's going to be more and more um, competition in terms of supplying vegetables in the region. And that means more competition um, supplying to Japan as well. Okay, so we have to be smart about it, we have to be more efficient about it. Um, you know, if we can reduce costs while we're doing it, then that's what we need to do because the competition will increase. 
Okay, so, you know, we've just had some terrific uh, presentations already, and I think I'm using one of your photos there, Richard, so sorry about that. <laughs> I won't publish it. Um, and it's great. We've got some really well-established product in market, onions, asparagus, um, we've got uh, carrots, we've got the leeks happening, we've got the mushrooms happening as well. It's really good to see. Um, and the recent uh, you know, interest in red onions is also very good to see as well. Uh, and you can see there, well, you probably can't see, but I'll tell you the red onions, it's, it's saying Tasmanian onions, you know. It's the branding and the profiling. So, and this is going to become more and more important. And for those companies already doing it, great, you're out in front. For those not doing it, this is where we need to go. You know, for consumers, a carrot is a carrot is a carrot, perhaps. But the more we can brand and profile, the more we can make a point of differentiation, uh, the better off we will be. Um, and sure, there's been a lot of talk about, um, as I said, the ageing population, decreasing number of farmers. You know, some of the customers we talk with talk about, you know, they're worried about uh, succession, succession planning in their own businesses and they're worried about who's going to be supplying all that domestic produce that the Japanese consumers like to buy. Because there's, you know, a few issues to sort out there with deregulation and also with... Um, you know, how are they going to sort of maintain the farming population? So it all points to, um, you know, what can we do now to make sure that we're positioned, you know, for the next three, five, ten years? Um, anything that can be done to extend shelf life, to work towards non-residue or lower residue levels, anything that can be done to better target seasonal gaps in the calendar, as onishi san talked about this morning, um, should all be considered and then promoting and building brand. And apart from the mainstays that we've just seen, there's also room for more niche product. And so let's be a little bit creative and think what, what do we have that might you know, be of high value in the market and we might be able to carve out a really good niche. Here's one example, um, Australian truffles in the market and they've got a good reputation and we're seeing more of them go out to high-end restaurants small volumes but high value, so uh, quite a viable business that's, that's growing there. Um, Australia's also exporting to the EU as well. Um, the same variety as the French and Italian truffles, so just an example of, you know, what else can we produce that could be use good in this market. Another example, um, there was a bit of talk about should we be producing Japanese style um, product or not. This is not commercially viable yet, perhaps. I mean, I know it has been grown in Tasmania or trialled in Tasmania for some time. But if you think about it, Japanese cuisine is becoming more and more popular right around the world. Um, Japanese food is, was registered on the World Cultural Heritage List as well. An integral part of Japanese food is wasabi. If you've ever eaten Japanese food, you may have eaten wasabi. It may have been by mistake. But you know, it, you, you've got to have wasabi with a lot of Japanese food. So wasabi has to be grown in very clean, flowing and, and shallow waters in a pristine environment. Okay? So um, it can be grown in the field as well. Uh, but is this a, you know, should we review this opportunity? Should we look at this again and think, you know, is this something that we could be producing um, and selling as well? Uh, Think about innovative uh, export products as well. At the moment, we're getting some frozen finger lime. Finger lime's a, a bush food. It doesn't have market access, so it can't get into the market fresh, but it can get in frozen. And we're seeing some growth there. Value-added products as well. Sorry, I'm speeding up because I'm wanting to <laughs> get a lot in. Value-added products, truffle in olive oil and sun-dried tomatoes. We're seeing more of that in the market as well. If they're processed or semi-processed, they don't have the same issues around market access. Larger mushrooms, the Japanese produce a lot of mushrooms, um, but they don't produce the really large ones that we can offer the market. Concentrated vegetable juice for manufacturing is also seeing some growth in market as well. I think um, Dr Mahler's um, presentation around the um, HPP is really interesting and, you know, should, uh, you know, some creative thinking around that would be really good in relation to what could go into Japan. Innovative products in Japan. Um, we put, I put this together last week. Um, starting from the 
the left hand top corner, um, veggies, veggie chips, veggies. Um, these are produced by one of the leading manufacturers of snack foods in Japan and all the vegetables in this product are imported except for the potatoes. They're very demanding with the spec for the vegetables. They've got to be top quality, um, they've got to be of the right size, etc. That you know, a typical sort of spec. Um, they're fried at a low temperature, at about 80 degrees, uh, and it retains the vegetables' flavour really well. Uh, and that's quite a popular product now. They'd like to be sourcing vegetables uh, from Australia as well. The next one, Hagen Dazs ice cream, tomato and cherry and carrot and orange. Now there's some consumers that think that they can get all their vegetable nutrients through ice cream. Uh, not too sure if that'll work, but um, it's a new product in the market and you know somebody is buying it. I tried to buy it to give it to my kids, but they refused to have it. Um, but again, let's be creative. You know they're going to need vegetable inputs. Thinking of vegetable as inputs or ingredients that can be somehow pre-processed. Um, let's do this in parallel to the fresh product wherever we can. The Australian um, herb paste—they've been in market for some time and are doing really well. And, you know, Japanese, like, like ourselves, you know, what do you do with a whole bunch of herbs once you've bought it and you only use a bit? You know, it doesn't last very long. Uh, so these are considered to be very innovative. Um, they have really good flavour and, you know, they're easy to keep in the fridge. Um, on the bottom there, we've got salted tomato snacks. These are freeze-dried tomato snacks. They're crunchy and salted. You know, the Japanese are quite um, imaginative and quite open when it comes to snack foods. We're, we're quite narrow, in fact. But the Japanese, you can have, uh, you can snack on all sorts of things, um, from seaweed to to whatever. And, and this is a, a good example. The one in the middle is tomato-flavored uh, boiled lollies. Uh, again, you know, the, the consumers believe there's some health attribute here. There may be. I tried these on the kids and, you know, the packet's still sitting there. <laughs> no one's eating them. But, as I said, the Japanese are used to the sort of savoury, salty, sort of sweet taste. You look at Japanese cuisine, it's, it's a savoury, salty, uh, sweet combination. And so these sorts of snacks are uh, very viable. And the last one is not a vegetable, it's fruit. I picked this up last week when I saw it in a supermarket. And it's just really uh, timely. Um, it's frozen grapes, Chilean grapes. And a few, well, a month or so ago, when Australian grapes came into the market, I was with the Australian Table Grape Association doing promotions in one of the high-end stores in Osaka. And I was explaining passionately uh, to, to anyone that would listen that you can freeze grapes and then give them to your kids as a snack in the summer. And that's what you do with loose grapes. Anyhow, I was really thrilled to see that someone's already thought of this and it's a product on the shelf. 100 grams, $4 Australian. Why can't we do this? The shelf life is two years. I mean, I fed them to the kids. The kids said, these are awful. They're bitter. I said, yeah, they are. Because <laughs> they'd been eating Australian grapes. Um, so just to get you thinking that, sure, you know, I mean, mainstream product is, is important. We can grow that area. Let's be innovative. Let's think um, and let's work in partnership and get some good ideas about what else can be done so that we've got more than one um, iron in the fire. All right, uh, just a little bit about oranges, which are not vegetables, but, um, you know, it's, it's our biggest fruit export is, is citrus and just wanted to show these ones because you can see there it shows um, 2013 Australian share of exports of oranges to Japan 30% uh, representing a fairly hefty value and you can see the trend is going up so they're doing really well. This is a case study I've taken out the company name but this company entered the market 2009 and has really grown their market share. Uh, they've done frequent visits to the market to talk through uh, their exports um, with their Japanese partner. Uh, they've worked exclusively with one importer and they've used promotional funds to do in-store uh, point-of-sale promotion tastings. They've got really good quality management going on in the field, which is really 
appreciated and noted by the Japanese partner. They've got uh, fruit under netting to reduce uh, wind blemish. And importantly, and I think this is the, the big thing at the moment, they've got computerised sugar testing. So they've got BRICS testing going on for the fruit and they can guarantee a consistent level. And consumers want consistency. Okay, table grapes. Um, I bring this up because they're just in the market and we, we helped with a, a launch at the embassy recently. Um, they're just in the market but, you know, this is the culmination of probably about eight years or so of preparation to get market access and then to get educated about it and then to get into the market. So collaboration has been really crucial to get them business ready. Um, they've gone for a unified approach instead of... Um, individual company approach and there was really good communication early on with people in the market, not just ourselves but others as well, so that they really could position themselves and, and better understand what they were getting into. Uh, the grapes were marketed at a higher price point than competitors and so they were perceived as expensive but uh, quite a bit of education went on with consumers to, as to why they're more expensive than Chilean grapes. And the prom promotion in market was really appreciated by the importers and we did plenty of in-store demonstrations, as you can see there. So they're in the market, that's fantastic. There's still a long way to go, though, to really position and brand and make sure that they're consistent and to keep educating the consumers about Australian grapes, to keep educating the growers. These are being field-packed. Lots of things could go wrong. There's a risk, lots of risk that need to be managed. Um, hopefully they'll be able to do that. I just want to bring this one up, Zespri. Um, anyone that's been to Japan and been inside a supermarket will probably will have seen kiwi fruit. It's one of the best marketing examples around. The New Zealanders have done it really well. Um, there's a, I won't give you the really long story, but it's, uh, you know, they've done it well because they have a country strategy, right? So they can't just have anyone selling kiwi fruit to Japan if they feel like it. They've got a really organised strategy, the growers are incentivised uh, and they've got really high benchmark for quality um, and, for, and the fruit is fantastic. Uh, they're in partnership with the company over there and the marketing is, is very um, systematic and very consistent. This is um, one thing they've done for the last five years or so. It's aimed at young female consumers and it's the 14-day... Um, eat a kiwi fruit every day for 14 days and you'll be beautiful and slim probably. I don't know, I haven't tried it. I will though. Um, but it's a, a really good um, campaign. Uh, it's using social media and so the consumers can go online and, and you know blog about uh, how terrific the kiwi fruit was that they ate and you know, the noticeable difference that they're seeing already. And they can talk with each other and pick up hints and so forth. It's very clever. And it works. Um, you know, we, we can do this kind of thing too. Uh, just another graph, you don't have to read it, but, you know, we, we talk about Australian product as being clean and green and safe, and mostly it is. But everyone else says the same thing. A lot of other countries say the same thing. It's not exclusive to us. Others are making the same claim. So let's not take it for granted that this will sell our product. You know, it's from Australia, of course it's safe. It's from Australia, of course it's good. Everyone else says the same thing. This was a survey that Austrade undertook of about 6,000 respondents. So we see New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, USA, France, Italy, Spain <laughs> and Australia all saying the same thing. So what's the opportunity? The opportunity is to better position our product um, to, to, if it is a premium product, let's, let's make sure it's positioned as such and let's underpin it with the reasons why. Let's make sure that we highlight the food safety protocols that are being followed. If we can give the um, distributors, the importers more information about that, let's do that. Let's make use of the comparative advantage, seasonal, counter-seasonal advantage. Uh, and look for gaps in the calendar, you know, extend the season if we can, really do it quite um, systematically and strategically. Play to our strengths. So if we've got product in market, 
great. Let's look at how it's being positioned. Uh, and it's just what I said before, food safety, competitive advantage. At the same time, we need to build strengths and that, that's about promotion in market, building more brand power and look, uh, you know, I think there's, um, it's worth thinking whether, you know, different companies can band together and come up with a, you know, a branding or some sort of um, messaging that actually, you know, is, is just beyond one company. We see all sorts of product in market with all different stickers, with all, you know, all different promotional um, paraphernalia and I sort of think, well, if we could just coordinate a little bit sometimes, you'd get much more bang for your buck. Innovate to add value, um, forward planning in the industry. If we don't have product on the market access list, why not, you know? Uh, we need productive investment into the sector so that we can get the processing happening and we need to utilise any benefits that come out of the FTA. Some of the common issues that we hear about and no doubt you hear about as well are export documentation discrepancies, um, the, the specs are demanding, the requirements are demanding, being able to meet, being across the MRLs uh, and really understand what the needs are in market. Um, and again, how can we sell at a premium? How can we sell premium at a higher price when so much of the product is hard to differentiate? Um, know the tastes and the preferences and the key aesthetic of, of consumers. Product fills a gap in the Japanese vegetable production calendar. Being responsive and flexible. Uh, and know your competitors. What are they doing? What's working for them? Can it work for us? Export first approach, and that came up today too. If you can do that, then your strategy will, you know, develop, and you'll have a much better chance of succeeding in the market. Rather than if it's humanely, it's a domestic approach. When product is left over, whatever, that's when you think about exporting. If for Japan, it's got to be an export first approach, and that includes product development, packaging, marketing, and consistency of supply. Uh, this was spoken about before, the Economic Partnership Agreement. I'm not going to go through all this, but I just do want to say that, you know, Japan's been off people's radars for so long. Uh, there's a bit of a, an upkick in the economy. We've got the Partnership Agreement. It will be signed. It'll be in force next year if all goes well. Um, don't miss the opportunity to, you know, that will generate more focus on Australian product. And if you can you know, utilise the benefits of the re reduced tariffs, uh, then, then do so. Now's the time to really think about it.